Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9. Now the wise man writes, Rejoice, O young man, thy youth. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. Walk in the ways of thine heart and the sight of thine eye. But know thou that for all these things that God will bring thee into judgment. As I read the book of Ecclesiastes, I cannot help but be impressed with the fact that God expects man to enjoy life. Ecclesiastes 2.24, Ecclesiastes 5.18 are two passages that particularly impressed this upon me, that I may enjoy life. And I believe Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 9 tells us that young people ought to enjoy life. But at the same time, the warning is given while it said, Rejoice in thy youth. The Bible tells us that God will bring us into judgment for everything that we do. So we need to recognize that we're to be happy. The years of youth are to be fun, to be enjoyable, but yet at the same time, we're to recognize that we're to stand in judgment for every act, every deed that we do in this life. Oftentimes, teenagers are told, these are the best years of your life. And I want to tell you something. I don't believe a single word of it. I don't believe the teenage years are the best years of a person's life. In many ways, they're the most unstable, the most insecure years that an individual ever goes through while he walks here on the face of this earth. I know the problems that you have to deal with. Many people that are teenagers don't know what they want to be in life. They don't know what they want to do for a living. They don't know what they want their occupation to be. You wonder a lot of times whether you'll ever get married, and if you ever do get married, who in the world it will be. I know all those problems that you have to deal with. And that's why I borrowed a title from a book written by Bob Buchanan and called the sermon tonight, Those Impossible Years. They're very difficult years, very trying years. And tonight we'll discuss from a practical standpoint some problems that young people have and some biblical answers to the problems that we have and some ways to deal with those problems as children of God. First question we want to discuss tonight is a question of peer pressure, a question of who will I be friends with. And like I said, it is one of peer pressure. We hear much about peer pressure in our day, being influenced by those around us. And as we begin discussing the subject, I want you to notice that there was particularly one great man in the New Testament, one faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, who was very affected by peer pressure. In Matthew chapter 26, on the night of Jesus' betrayal, he told his disciples, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. And Peter stood up and said, Though I die with you, I will never forsake you. Peter said, Lord, I'm not going to forsake you. Jesus said, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter drew his sword and was ready to fight to the death for Christ. When Peter said, though I die with you, I'll never forsake you, I believe he meant it. He was ready to fight. He was ready to lay down his life for Christ. But yet, beginning in verse 58 of Matthew 26, we find that Peter goes and sits with the enemies of Jesus. And three times, beginning with verse 58 through verse 75, the end of Matthew 26, three times he denies Christ. He curses and swears and says, I don't know the man. The point is, when Peter was around good company, Peter said, I'll never forsake you, Lord. But when he was in the wrong crowd, he did deny Jesus. In Galatians chapter 2, Something that took place several years after Jesus had died on the cross and ascended back into heaven. In Galatians 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul writes, When Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came from James, he had eaten with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. My friend, when Jews came down and encouraged Peter not to eat with the Gentiles. Peter was affected by it. Peter withdrew himself. This great man was affected by peer pressure. 
And so it doesn't surprise, surprise me today that a lot of people succumb to peer pressure and do things that they ought not do because they're influenced by those around them. The book of Proverbs could be summed up in one word, and that one word would be wisdom. Wisdom is the theme of the book of Proverbs. You find the words wise and the words wisdom mentioned well over a hundred times in that 31 chapter book. And the book of Proverbs puts a lot of emphasis upon our companions. In Proverbs 13, verse 20, the Bible says, He that walketh with wise shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Proverbs 14, verse 7, Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Proverbs 23, verses 20 and 21, Be not among wine members, nor riots of cedars of flesh, for the glutton and the drunkard shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with wrath. Proverbs 24, verse 1, Be not envious of evil men, neither desire to be with them. Proverbs 28, verse 7, A companion of righteous men shameth his father. So the book of Proverbs, and that's just five of the many passages that could be picked out, the book of Proverbs puts a lot of emphasis on who we associate with, who we are friends with in this life. And one way to overcome the problem of peer pressure is by not associating with those people that are wicked, but by associating with those people that are righteous and trying to live close to God. We quote Psalms 1, verses 1 and 2 a lot. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way with sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of a scornful. But his delight is the law of the Lord, and in that law doth he meditate both day and night. Have you ever noticed that in Psalms chapter 1, in verse 1, there's a progression in Psalms 1, verse 1, first we find the individual walking with the sinner. Then the man is standing with the sinner, and finally he's sitting with the sinner. And the Bible says, blessed is the man that doesn't do that, but the man that meditates in the law of God. And I want to tell you something. That in high school, in junior high school, when you're bothered by peer pressure, and when individuals try to make you, try to encourage you to smoke, to drink, to engage in activities you know that you ought not to engage in, that you don't have to do that to be popular. In the years that I was in high school, the most popular individual that attended Dixon County Senior High School in Dixon, Tennessee, was a man or at the time, a boy by the name of Max Caldet. And Max was a member of the church who didn't smoke, drink, and he didn't attend dance. Everyone respected him. He could have had a choice of any girl at school. And all the guys looked up to him. He didn't do any of these things. You don't have to do the things the world does to be popular. But I want to tell you something else. Even if you did have to do these things to be popular, it's not worth the price. Amen. The Bible asks in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And we often apply that verse in the sense of riches. If I'm going to be the richest man on the face of the earth and yet lose my soul, it hasn't done me any good. But what good does it do if everybody knows my name and everybody cheers when I walk by if I go to hell? Don't make any difference. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, the Bible talks about Moses who refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. How that he suffered affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So we don't have to be wicked to be popular. But if we did, it's too great of a price to pay. And we need to watch who we hang around with and who we associate with because we oftentimes have a tendency to become like those with whom we associate. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25 tells us to make no company with an angry man, lest thou learn his ways. 
We often become like those with whom we associate, and that's why the Bible warns us so extensively about who we do associate with. So one problem that we're faced with oftentimes when we're, when we're young is who will I be friends with? Peer pressure. But if you choose the right kind of friends, peer pressure can be a positive thing instead of a negative thing. Now, peer pressure is a type of overriding problem that will affect everything else that we talk about. Beginning now, I want to deal with a few specific issues that may come up in your life and that you will have to face from time to time. The first question deals with the subject of alcohol. Am I going to drink? And it doesn't take me to stand up here and tell you that it's a great problem. You're in high school. You know many people that do. In a book written by a man named Don Humphrey, The Christian Social Drinking, pages 10 and 11, he lists the following facts which parents need to recognize. 75% of high school students drink to some extent. Three out of four. 36% of male high school seniors get drunk at least four times a year. 9% of all 12 to 17 year olds drink to some extent. And I would think it would be a lot higher than that. Maybe I just pointed that statistic. And finally, 25% of all 13 year olds could be considered at least moderate drink. And there are a lot more statistics that could be given to show what a staggering problem alcohol is among you. And we need to look and see what the Bible says about these, this particular problem. When I pick up my Bible and begin to read its pages, I'm impressed with the number of warnings that we have in the Bible against the use of alcohol. In Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker. In strong drink raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. In Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 through 33, the questions are asked, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath family, who hath wounds without cause, who hath readiness of eye? It's answered in verse 30, They that tarry long in wine, and they that go to seek mixed wine. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink and continue until night until wine and flame thee. Now a New Testament passage, and the best New Testament passage I think that we can use to, self, to show that social drinking is contrary to the law of God is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And there Peter writes, For the time past of our life may suffice us to draw the will of the Gentile. When we walked in lasciviousness, excess of wine, translated wine beatings the American standard, reveling, banqueting, that's translated carousings in the American standard, and if you had the new American standard, I believe that's translated drinking games. So you can see that Peter is not just talking about drunkenness, but drinking games. Abominable idolatries, verse 3, verse 4, wherefore they think it strange that you run not with them the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. So these are some of the warnings in the Bible that are given against the use of alcoholic beverages. But another thing is very impressive to me when I read the scripture. And that is how many people sinned under the influence of alcohol or how many people were taken advantage of under the influence of alcohol. I'll show you what I mean. The first man in the Bible to ever become drunk, and this may surprise you, was Noah. Noah was one of the two people in the Bible that was said to walk with God, and yet he was the first man to ever become drunk. And in Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 through 25, you see that sin is associated, possibly homosexuality, sin is associated with the drunkenness of Noah. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 30 through 35, after Lot had escaped the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the record tells us that his oldest daughter made him drunk. Lot's oldest daughter made him drunk and made Lot lie with her so that she would be with child by her father. 
Lot committed incest under the influence of alcohol. And the next night, the younger daughter got the father drunk and did the same thing, so she became with child. She became pregnant from her father. Now, Lot was a righteous man. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 tell us he was a righteous man. And there's no way that he would have acted in such a way unless he would have been under the influence of alcohol. A couple of other situations we have in the Old Testament. Remember the story of David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And after Bathsheba became pregnant, after she became with child, she told David, and David was frantic and tried to make you right think the child that was born to his wife, Bathsheba, was his own. And he told Uriah to go down to his wife and to lie with her. He wouldn't do it. And then if you continue to read in 2 Samuel 11, you'll find that David made Uriah drunk. He thought that if he was drunk, that he could take advantage of him and get him to go and lie with his wife. Uriah didn't do it. But still David recognized the power of the influence of alcohol. Two chapters later in 2 Samuel 13, we find in verse 28 that Amnon said, or Absalom said to his servants, to make Amnon drunk and then to kill him. He could take influence or he could take advantage of Amnon when he was under the influence of alcohol. And in Esther chapter 1, we have a case there where King Ahasuerus acted wickedly under the influence of alcohol. So in the Bible, we see that people were taken advantage of, or people sinned and did things they wouldn't have otherwise have done if they had not been under the influence of alcoholic beverage. And let's ask, why ought alcohol to be avoided? One of the reasons I've just finished mentioning is that alcohol impairs moral judgment. And all the cases of Noah and Lot show that. Turn back to Proverbs 23 just a second. We read Proverbs 23, verses 29 and 30 about the warnings of alcohol, a warning against alcohol. In verses 31 through 33, the story continues and says, Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, and the lash it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. The point is that under the influence of alcohol, people do things they wouldn't normally do. Thine eyes will behold strange women. Thine heart will utter perverse things. So one reason we should avoid alcohol. We should avoid alcohol because it impairs our moral judgment. We should avoid alcoholic beverages because the fruits of alcohol are evil. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 20, Jesus said, You shall know a tree by its fruits. A good tree will bring forth good fruits, and an evil tree will bring forth evil fruit. Now, I recognize that Jesus was not talking about alcohol, but he was talking about false teachers. However, I believe we can apply the same text to alcohol. What are the fruits of alcohol? The fruits of alcohol are divorce, broken homes, murder, other forms of crime. That's the fruits of alcohol. The commercials run by alcoholic or beer companies today are very, very deceiving. They get former athletes who were once among the greatest in the world to come in and to endorse a particular brand of beer. Every sports team I ever played on had the fruit that if any drank alcoholic beverages, they were off the table. Now, some of the people did. They didn't get caught. But if the coach would have known about it, they would have been off. Now, if alcohol makes you such an outstanding athlete, it's a shame that some of my coaches didn't know better. Maybe I'd be in the major leagues. But the truth is that alcohol doesn't make you run fast. It doesn't make you jump high. And it doesn't make you become stronger. In truth, it dims your thinking and slows your reflexes. That's what it does. So alcohol 
does not make you a better athlete. Alcohols, fruits are evil. It leads to evil things and not good things, as it oftentimes seems by the advertisements you see around us. Now, the first two points I've made, why we should avoid alcohol, it impairs moral judgment and the fruits are evil. Someone may say, well, that would just refer to drunkenness. That would refer to social drinking as we know it. But this third point would apply to any type of drinking, social drinking, any kind. And that is it hurts the influence. The Bible tells in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 that we're to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our fathers in heaven. 1 Peter 2 verse 12, we're to have our conversation honest among the Gentiles and whereas they speak against us as evildoers, they may by our good conversation glorify God in the day of visitation. So we're to have good influences in the community about us, but those that know us, we ought to be examples of Christians. And do you think you're doing this by the drinking of alcoholic beverages? I don't think so. I don't believe so. Try talking to your neighbor about the gospel of Christ with a can of beer in your hand. I don't think that you're going to get very far. It's not going to help your influence. Now, I've listed three reasons why you should avoid alcohol. And there are a lot more that could be given. But how many do you have to have? And if there's anyone in the audience tonight that knows a reason why we should drink in any shape, form, or fashion, then after I finish this evening, you come up and write it right under there. I'll be glad to have you do it. I don't imagine the elders would mind. One defense is often made of the drinking of alcoholic beverages is Jesus Christ drank. And really, we don't know from the New Testament that Christ drank at all, which is an interesting point. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, Jesus was accused by his enemies of drinking, but he was also accused in that same verse of being a gluttonous man, so we know that's not so. In John chapter 2, Jesus did turn the water to wine, while he didn't drink it, and we have no case in the New Testament of him drinking it, I could not say from that case that he would be against the drinking of that type of wine since he did provide it. But I think we make a grave mistake when every time we read the New Testament, we think of the modern type of wines that we see in the supermarket today. A matter of fact, I know at least one passage in the Bible that beyond any shadow of a doubt where the word wine is used could not refer to alcoholic beverage. And that's in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 8 where the Bible talks about the wine being found in the cluster. The juice is still in the grave and the Bible speaks of it as wine. Now, there may be other passages similar to that, but I know there's at least one passage where the word wine is used where it refers to a non-alcoholic beverage. But we should avoid it. You know, in all my years of junior high and high school, I never had one single individual ask me if I wanted to drink. And I didn't have one single individual ask me to buy drugs or ask me if I wanted any or ask me to even smoke a cigarette. Did I grow up in some community in which there weren't any sinners? There were a couple. But, if they know what type of person you are, and if you live a godly life, those things aren't going to present a problem. I had several parents and asked me, who had students in high school, how the drug problem is. I said, I've never seen it, but I know it's there if I, you want it. And that's the way it is. And if you live the right type of life, you consider it a compliment that no one ever asked you this type of question. And along the same lines, talk about drinking, talk about another subject that may confront you when you're young. It confronts many people when they're older. How about smoking? I mentioned a while ago that on every athletic team I was ever on, we had the rule that we couldn't drink. We also had the rule that we couldn't smoke. The only rules we ever had, we couldn't drink, couldn't smoke, we couldn't use drugs, but those were rules on every team that I was ever on. 
In America, they're over $9 billion spent on tobacco every single year. And should the Christian engage in the use of it? Well, I think there are several reasons why we should abstain, and particularly talking to young people, why they should never begin. Because the Bible teaches us that our bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost, and we're not to defile our bodies, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, and smoking obviously does that. I don't have to get up here and read a lot of doctor reports to show you that smoking's hazardous to your health. You know that. Even in our super liberal society, smoking commercials were taken off the air over 10 years ago. And that should tell you a little bit of something. Another thing about smoking is it's harmful to your influence. Jimmy Allen, who's an institutional preacher in Arkansas, teaches at Harding College. Well, he's the head of the Bible department at Harding, isn't he? But several years ago, I heard him make the same argument about smoking I made just a second ago about the drinking of alcoholic beverages. And what kind of influence are you going to have when you try to talk to your neighbor about the gospel of Christ if you're puffing on a cigarette? I don't believe it's going to have a whole lot of influence. There are a lot of people that believe that's wrong. A lot of religious groups that believe and teach that smoking is wrong. And I believe the Bible teaches also it's wrong. And what kind of influence are you going to have? Another question to ask. And another thing to consider for those that do smoke or for those that are being tempted to begin is the golden rule. Matthew 7, verse 12, Jesus said we ought to treat others like we would expect to be treated. And oftentimes, smokers are very inconsiderate of that fact. Suppose you did have the right to smoke. I think in a lot of cases, such as in restaurants, you would really be trampling over the rights of other people by engaging in that activity, even if you did have the right to do it. I think that's something people need to recognize. We don't think about that very often. The golden rule, we hear a lot of people praise it, but yet very few people really live. Why not treat others like we ourselves expect to be treated? Another subject along the same line we'll deal with briefly is the subject of drugs and the use of them. There are a couple of passages in the New Testament I could turn to, I think, to show plainly that drug abuse is wrong. And I hope you'll turn your Bibles to Galatians 5. The use of such drugs as marijuana and amphetamines and barbiturates, heroin are getting popular in these days. There's been much controversy over whether marijuana should be legalized, and even in North Carolina, which would be considered by many as a conservative state, nonetheless, the number one cash crop in that state is marijuana. And I'll throw this in. It's always amazed me why if that's illegal, how people know it's a number one case. But you can think about that. But in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Now that's the word I want to call your attention to. Now this is the same word used in Revelation 21, verse 8, that's translated sorceries. And by the way, I'm reading from the King James Version. Now the word witchcraft in Galatians 5, 20, and the word sorceries in Revelation 21, verse 8, comes from the Greek word from which we get our English word pharmacy. And it's defined by vines as the use of drugs. That's one of the things mentioned, vines definition, of pharmacate, the Greek word translated witchcraft in Galatians 5.20 and translated sorceries in Revelation 21.8. And you know what Revelation 21.8 tells us? It tells us those that do things mentioned in that passage will have their part in the lake it burns with fire and brimstone. And Galatians 5.19-21 tells us in that passage of Scripture that those that do these type things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And you don't have to be popular to do it. I couldn't say it about drinking, but I could say it about the use of drugs. I don't think most high school students are involved in it. And you don't have to be popular to do it. But even if you did, it's still contrary to the Word of God, and you can't involve in such and be pleasing to God. 
So a lot of problems that you face, such as drinking, smoking, and drugs, I'm convinced you know the right answers to these questions, and I'm convinced you know that you shouldn't be involved in it. It's just a matter of whether you're going to have the courage to stand up and do what's right. You know, a dead fish can float downstream, but it takes a live one to go against the tide. And which one are you going to be? Are you going to go with the crowd and do what you know is wrong, or are you going to stand up and be counted? There's another subject that we want to deal with. A couple of other subjects we'll deal with. One is the subject of fornication. And according to surveys nowadays, some 80% of males are involved in premarital sex and 70% of females are involved in premarital sex, fornication. But the Bible teaches us plainly that it's wrong. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18, the Bible tells us to flee fornication. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3 to abstain from fornication. And we have one of the greatest examples of a faithful young child of God in the entire Bible fleeing fornication in Genesis 39. In Genesis 39, there Potiphar's wife asked Joseph to lie with thee. And the record tells us that there came a day when everyone had gone out of the house. No one would have known what was taking place. But yet still, Joseph refused to lie with Pharaoh's daughter. And he asked one of the greatest questions on the pages of God's Word in Genesis 39, verse 9. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And when you're tempted by such a situation, you need to ask the same question. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? But at the same time, I recognize that it's a very, very real problem. I had an individual who's a very close friend of mine, an individual that some of you know, who plans to give his life to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He told me when I was in school, he said, Tommy, some days I think I could go forever. There. And there are other days I just don't know how long. You know. And I know that type situation. And I recognize that it's a very real problem. But we have to learn temperance and have to learn self control. <coughs> and when these lusts seem strong, we must recognize that we, above all things, have to hold out and have to remain faithful to God. And the few moments of fleeing pleasure that may come from fulfilling my sexual lust won't be worth an eternity in a devil's hell. But I'll tell you a couple reasons why the problem of fornication is so terrible. The problem of fornication is so terrible is because we condone so many things that lead to fornication. And there are so many things in our society that are just accepted as good and wholesome that end up unwed mothers, children being born unwed. And discuss these just a second. I think one of the problems that oftentimes leads to fornication is the problem of dancing. I think there are two words in Galatians 5, 19 through 21 that we can deal dancing, one of them being lasciviousness, which is defined as indecent bodily movements and unchaste handling of male and females, and the other one being reverence. And when you have peer pressure to go to the prom, and it's about that time of year up here, I suppose, when you have peer pressure to attend other such type dances which will excite lust and lead many individuals to commit fornication, you have to be able to have the courage to stand up. But there's another problem, very serious problem, that oftentimes leads to fornication, and that's the problem of the modest apparel. And it's really hard to get away from that problem nowadays. Even if you dress modestly, you can't hardly drive down the road without some billboard portraying a modestly clad woman. And on television, they'll hit you with it right and left. And it's a very, very serious problem. Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 and 10, that women are adorning themselves in modest apparel. 
But you know something? I could stand up here and I could read that verse and I could say that we ought to dress modestly and everyone would say amen. Shake my hand when I go out and probably go out and in the summer, if there is a summer in Wisconsin, go out and wear the same type of clothes they've always worn. There was a survey taken when I was at college in the fall of 1984. And I've read this survey in a sermon in Florida before that some of you may have heard. This was a survey taken, a survey given to men as to what they felt was modest and immodest in women, and a survey given to women as to what they thought was modest and immodest in men. Now I recognize what a particular stu student body decides is truth doesn't make truth. But I think this survey is particularly revealing. Because when you dress in such a way as to cause another individual to lust, and they write down your own paper and say, yes, it causes me to lust, then I think that you ought to beware of that type of dress. Now I want you to listen to the following results. This was a survey given to men as to what they thought was immodest and modest on women. Women. Men, do you think that shorts on a woman are modest? 52 said no. Zero said yes. One had another answer. Does it cause you to lust? Forty-five said yes, it does cause me to lust. And eight people either said no or had other answers. The next question concerned high slits and skirts. Are high slits and skirts mine? Five said yes. Forty-five said no. And three had other answers, and you should have read some of the other answers, by the way. Does it cause you to love? 33 said yes. This is again high slits. 33 said yes, it does. 10 said no, it does not. And 14 had other answers. Tight jeans on women. Do they cause, are they modest? 46 said no. Three said yes, they're modest. And five had other answers. Do tight jeans on women cause you to lust? 29 men said yes, 15 said no, 10 had other answers. They were asked to make a comment about bathing suits, and this was not given in the form of a yes or no question, but the overwhelming answer is that bathing suits were modest. Now that's what the student body said. That's not what I said. As a matter of fact, I didn't even fill out one of these surveys. I was given a sheet of paper, but I lost it. But that's what they said as to what affected them and what didn't affect them in the particular area of women's rights. I had a good friend at school last year talking about the subject of bathing suits just a moment. A good friend at school who was a very righteous, a very good individual. And he was talking to me about a couple of times that he had went to the beach. And we began discussing that. And we began talking as to whether he should or shouldn't go, and he told me plainly, I don't know why I go, because I lust every single day. And that wasn't an individual who was trying to lust or who was going just to look at the girl. But yet he admitted plainly that, yes, I lust every single day. And I don't see how. A normal man could go to the beach and see women dressed in bikinis and string bikinis and one-piece bathing suits, which I do not believe are modest, and not love. I don't see how you could not have that reaction. It's beyond me. But you know, women can lust after men, too. We have an example of that in Genesis 39, where Potiphar's wife lusted after Joseph. And we have an example in Proverbs chapter 7 of a woman lusting after a man. But this was a survey given to women about what they thought was modest and immodest on a man. So I'm not just talking to women and saying women should dress modestly, and young women saying you should dress modestly, but to men and young men saying you should too, and I too, should dress the way God would have me to. Tight jeans on men, are they modest? 53 said no. Zero said yes. Two had other answers. The tight jeans on men cause you to lust. 21 said yes, 22 said no, and 12 had other answers. Men wearing shorts, are they modest? 
One had yes. 47 had no. Seven had up. Interesting. Does it cause you to lose? 20 said yes. 25 had no. Nine had other answers. Is it modest to wear clothing in sporting activities that would otherwise be considered immodest? Nine had yes, 20, 42 had no, and two had other answers. Now, I recognize that something might be appropriate in one particular place and not be appropriate in another, but if something's immodest in one place, it's immodest in another. Amen. Is it modest for a man to go shirtless in public? Eight said yes, 41 said no, and five had other answers. So we need to take heed of how we dress ourselves. And in our sex-oriented society, we need to particularly watch how we dress to make sure that we don't excite lust in others. So fornication is a terrible problem, but one thing that leads to it being such a terrible problem are things like dancing in the body's apparel. Quickly, I want to mention another subject that I alluded to in the beginning of the lesson, and that is a thing young people think about a lot. And that is the subject of marriage. And like I said, a lot of times you wonder if I'm ever going to get married and who it will be, who the fortunate individual will be if I ever do happen to get married. And I don't believe the New Testament teaches that it's sin for a Christian to marry a non-Christian. And I think 1 Corinthians 7, verses 12 through 16, and 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2, we see cases where a Christian was married to a non-Christian. I don't believe the statement in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, be not unequally yoked with the unbeliever, has any reference to marriage. But at the same time, I want to point out that in the New Testament, or all throughout the Bible, when Christians marry non-Christians, or when people of God married those that could care less about God, it always led to a lot of problems. Have you recognized in Genesis chapter 6, when the Bible talks about the wickedness of man and how man was so wicked that God determined to destroy man with a flood, that there's only one thing mentioned to indicate man's wickedness, and that is the sons of God married the daughters of men. And the sons of God were not angels, as some suppose. For in Matthew 22, verse 29 and 30, the Bible says angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. But the sons of God, I believe, are those righteous descendants of Seth, those who were trying to live according to the word of God. And the wicked men or the wicked women were those that were daughters of Cain, those that did not try to live pleasing to God. And when they married, that was given as a cause of the wickedness of the earth and why God destroyed them. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 1 through 4, the Bible talks about how the children of Israel were not to marry people from other nations. And the reason why is because they would turn their hearts away from serving God. And in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, we find that's what's happened to Solomon. Solomon married 700 wives, 300 concubines. They turned his heart away from serving God. And the argument is made in Nehemiah 13, 25 through 27, that even if why Solomon was turned away by these strange women, how much heed we should take to who we become involved with, how much heed we should take to who we marry. So we need to recognize that there are worse things in life than being unmarried. I don't know how many in the audience are familiar with Charles Wendall. But he is a denominational preacher in the state of California who is a very intelligent man, and he is a very practical man. He's written many good books. Hand me another brick, three steps forward, two steps back. And he says that he talks with many girls that are about 24 years of age who are just so worried because they think they'll never be married. And... They're ready to marry the first person that comes along. And he tells them that he knows a lot of women that are 34 that have been married 10 years that wish they could go back to when they were 24 and had the choice again. If it comes between me living a lifetime and an unhappy marriage and me 
remaining single the rest of my life, I'll gladly choose to remain single. And so when you think about marriage, recognize that you have plenty of time and make the right decision. Don't marry someone that's going to lead you to hell. Marry someone that will help encourage you to make happy one day. But as I'm closing, I want to make a last appeal. Now, I've talked about a lot of problems that young people have. And a lot of problems that all of us have. But even when you're young, you can be a great influence for God. I think it's very significant that some of the greatest men of the Bible came to be great men when they were only very young. Roy Chandler preaching a sermon, God's teenage hero. One of them was Joseph, who when he was forsaken by his family, forsaken by his brethren, and he was in a land of immorality, a land of idolatry, still he was faithful to God and showed the essence of moral character. Think about Samuel, who when he was just a child, ministered to the Lord, 1 Samuel 3, 1. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who most scholars think were only between 12 and 15 years of age when they stood up and were ready to lay down their lives for God. Jesus Christ, at the age of 12, sat in the temple, spoke with the learned men of the law. The point is, we often talk about the negative and the young people are going to the dogs. I don't believe that. I don't believe that so. And I recognize that in my preaching, I touch the hearts of a lot more younger people than older people. And I have been able to talk, I would rather talk to a young person that's involved in some sin than an older one. Because sometimes they're more willing to tell. What I am saying is you can be a great force for God while you're young. You can be one of God's teenage heroes. Remember thy creator when the days of thy youth and evil days come not in the years drawn? No, no, I don't say I have no pleasure in it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, that no man despise thy youth. The inside of believers in word, all the conversation with thee. First Timothy 4, verse 12. So there are a lot of problems you have, but there's nothing that you can't overcome. Finally, to anyone in the audience, young or old, that's not a Christian. The way you become one to believe Christ to be the Son of God, to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Done that, not living the way you should. Come repent of your sins, confess your sins. Pray God to you. Ask your sins and ask your sins. Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting in the cold?
We're glad for your presence. I want to say a hearty amen to the things that were said this evening, and I hope that you understand that this lesson tonight was not presented by some old fuddy-duddy grandfather type. I think you're well aware of that, and Brother Peter won't object, I think, to me telling you that he is one year beyond being a teenager himself. And he has, he knows whereof he speaks, and we're encouraged by the fact that tonight we have evidence that truth is truth, and it's unchangeable regardless of who teaches it. And we're encouraged by the fact that what seem to be impossible years are not impossible for the righteous who seek to serve God. All of us, young people, not so young and old, parents and children alike, can profit from the lesson of the scene. We want to encourage you to be back tomorrow evening for the final service in this week, and then of course on the first day of the week we meet at 9.45 and 10.45 and 6, and then this meeting will be history. We urge you to come back and encourage others to come. Is there any further announcement that should be made before we're dismissed? If not, among our visitors is Brother Keith Barkley, who labors with the Lord's people in Janesville. We're going to ask him to lead us in prayer, and then we shall be dismissed. Eternal Father, it's with humility that we bow before thee now to thank thee for this day, for its beauty, and for all of the blessings that thou hast bestowed upon each one of us. We're thankful, Father, for our health and for our well-being, for all of the physical things that thou granted unto us, the comforts uh, that we so, are so blessed with and that we enjoy so much. We pray that we might always give thee the thanks that is deserving of thee for the gifts that thou hast given us. We're especially thankful for the time that we've had to hear thy word proclaimed. We pray that our hearts will be receptive to the truth preached, that the young people will accept those things and will have the courage to withstand the pressure that they feel from their peers, that those of us who are older and who are parents, that we will live a life that is exemplary, that they can look to for strength, that we might teach our own children thy ways, that they will be able to withstand the temptations of the devil, and that we all in the last day might hear thee say, well done, thy good and servants. Father, we're thankful for Brother Peter. We pray that Thou would always be with him. We pray that thou, thou would bless him as he continues to serve thee, as well as all those who labor in thy word. Father, we want to pray especially now that thou forgive us of our wrongs. For we are sinners. We need thy forgiveness. We need the strength that only thou can give to overcome the temptations that face us every day. We ask thy forgiveness and that thou cleanse us with the blood of thy Son as we turn from our wickedness. And as we turn to do those things we know we ought to do, but fail to do in the past. And we ask that thou would forgive us of those things that we're not yet aware of that are evil. That thou would help us to understand the evil in our life and to overcome it. Be with us as we travel home. We will be brethren throughout the rest of this year. See us safely home and be with us till we meet again. It's our prayer in thy son Jesus' precious name. Amen.